Now for today's program. Eric K. Ward is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. Throughout his career, Eric has worked with community groups, government and business leaders, human rights advocates, and philanthropy. He currently serves as executive director of Western State Center, is senior fellow with Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward, and chair of the Proteus Fund. Eric is the recipient of the 2021 Civil Courage Prize. Dr. Janet DeWert Bell is a communication strategist and management consultant, as well as a social justice advocate. Dr. DeWert Bell established the Derrick Bell Lecture Series on Race in American Society at the New York University School of Law, now in its 26th year. She is the author of Race, Rights, and Redemption, the Derrick Bell Lectures on Law and Critical Race Theory, as well as Lighting the Fires of Freedom, African American Women in the Civil Rights Movement. Dr. Mia Brett holds a PhD in history with a specialization in American legal history and the legal construction of race. She is a freelance writer and a political activist and has served as an adjunct professor at several different universities in New York City. Nadine Epstein is an award-winning journalist, writer, and speaker. She's been the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine since 2004 and is the founder and executive director of the Center for Creative Change. As a young reporter in Chicago, she covered the city's impoverished South Side and public housing projects, as well as Mayor Harold Washington, Chicago's first Black mayor, the Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr., and the Nation of Islam. She also covered white supremacist groups and other right-wing movements while reporting from the U.S.-Mexico border. Nadine speaks widely about anti-Semitism and other topics and is the author of several books, including the recent RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, which she wrote in collaboration with the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Please welcome Eric K. Ward, Dr. Janet Dewart bell Dr. Mia Brett, and Nadine Epstein. Welcome for joining us. And I'm going to actually, Eric, you were going to say a couple words to start, and then I'm going to say a couple words. Wonderful, Nadine. It's so uh, uh, wonderful to see you, and it's wonderful to see our guests. Thank you, everyone for joining. We are going to have a dynamic conversation. Uh, again, my name is Eric Ward, Executive Director of, of Western State Center. Today we're going to be having a conversation uh, around the, uh, the ongoing debate, right, or conversation that's happening in this nation around critical race theory. We're going to be talking about what critical race theory is and uh, uh, understanding, right, that Currently, critical race theory is at the center of a political debate uh, and attacks uh, by those who seek to erase America's history, in my opinion. But I want to give first uh, um, uh, one modifier, right? One does not sit down for a 90-minute conversation on heart surgery and expect to walk out a qualified heart surgeon. In, in the same way, right, we, we ask those who are listening to, to understand that the role today is not to teach you everything there is to know about the underpinnings of race in America, right? Uh, uh, the debate around critical race theory, that's simply impossible in 90 minutes. What we hope to do though, is to spark curiosity, to challenge uh, conventional wisdom and to reset the table on a conversation that we believe impacts both the black and Jewish community. Efforts to combat right, and or, uh, um, or, or to prevent the teaching of, of race, right, and belonging in public and private education is, is not new. Uh, we can go back, right, long before the conversation on critical race theory to understand the con controversy such as the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial, the 1956 resistance, to school desegregation when 101 of 128 Southern congressional members signed the Southern Manifesto denouncing the idea of school desegregation, the battles over sex education in the 1980s, right, and the debate over the inclusion of the LGBTQ community and their place in American history in 1990s. Nor is the conversation around race and new to education itself, right? Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week, now known as Black History Month, 
right, launched Black, uh, Black Negro Week in the early parts of the 1900s. Both race and racism and Black history have long been taught uh, in public education. So what is this recent controversy? Well, I think it's important, Nadine, that we start by understanding uh, a few points. One is the founder of the leading activist around the attacks on critical race theory. His name is Christopher Rufo, and he's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, also a fellow at the Discovery Institute, a, a Christian nationalist organization that challenges scientific notions such as evolution being taught uh, in schools. A year ago, Christopher Rufo, who launched this attack on critical race theory, put in his own tweet, the goal here is to have the public read something, quote, crazy in the newspapers and immediately think critical race theory. He goes on to write, we have decodified the term and we will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. He says, we have successfully frozen the, bland, the brand critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under the brand category. In short, what we understand is that some elements in our society have attached and attacked critical race theory in order to reconfigure it into a larger conversation around the culture war. We hope to today unpack some of those notions around why critical race theory was targeted, but what is critical race theory? And what is the actual conversation that people are concerned about, historical memory, structural bias in our societies. We have great uh, presenters with us to explore these conversations, and we're delighted to be exploring it with you, and we'll be getting in more detail very shortly. And I just wanna add that we're also gonna be discussing, and this is so important, what, how we can lead to cultural change, how we can, what we can, how, what we can do to move forward, and we're gonna be getting to that towards the end of the conversation or at least in the latter part of the conversation, but I thought we should start out with something be very basic. And I'll start with you, Eric, and um, is, well, what is critical race theory? What are we actually talking about today? Yes. So critical race theory uh, is an intellectual way of looking at systemic racism. Critical race theory is a legal philosophy that is rooted in the notion that racism is systemic. And we will hear from Janet Dewar Bell uh, a, a little bit more about the underpinnings. It is first uh, uh, evolved from one of the most powerful legal theorists, uh, um, uh, uh, Derek Bell, uh, now deceased. Derek Bell is a professor of law uh, and was an expert in understanding structural racism. Uh, Derek Bell made a very simple argument. Uh, the argument was, right, that uh, we should understand that racism is a permanent part of American society, that it wasn't simply just a set of behaviors or attitudes, but that it was part of the systems upon which we walk in our world. Not very different from the argument I make in Skin in the Game, how anti-Semitism fuels white nationalism. In that essay, I'm influenced by Derek Bell's argument that anti-Semitism itself is not just a set of individual behaviors. It is a narrative and an attitude that doesn't only fuel individual action, right? But conditions, systems, and structures, right, to act in ways that show bias against the Jewish community. In the same way, critical race theory made a similar art, art argument. This is the notion of uh, critical race theory. But critical race theory came under attack, right? The argument was that it was divisive and racist by actually pointing out that racism existed. Opponents often write that critical race theory promotes an anti-American view uh, and raises white guilt. In fact, critical race theory uh, uh, eschews the idea of white guilt. 
it actually argues that the way that we move forward to a multiracial democracy is by joining together and addressing systems of bias. In response, though, to Christopher Rufo's attempt to demonize race theory, several states passed legislation banning the teaching of critical race theory, which was largely taught in law schools, right, and only in a few, forcing some academic institutions to cancel classes. Much of the uproar around critical race theory was a dog whistle attack against the 1619 Project by Pulitzer winning journalist, Nicole Hannah Jones, who helped to reignite interest in how history is taught in the classrooms. With the recent uh, rise in racial unrest, police brutality, white nationalist hate crimes, educators were looking at ways to be more inclusive in teaching history and found Nicole Hannah Jones uh, 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 work to be quite useful. In September of 2020, then President Trump, a vocal critic of the 1619 Project, created the 1776 Commission. It was designed in his words to promote patriotic education. He then directed federal agencies to stop training, uh, uh, directed towards diversity and inclusion. That directive was later blocked by a federal judge and then overturned by President Biden. In the aftermath, Florida, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, Arkansas, Idaho, and Tennessee passed or introduced legislation aimed at banning what they called critical race theory in classrooms. At a state board of education meeting in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis said at that point, as the governor of Florida, I love this state, I love my country, and then he goes on to say, I find it unthinkable that there are other people in positions of leadership in the federal government who believe that we should teach kids hate in our country. We will not stand it, we'll stand for it here in Florida. In short, what he was saying is that talking about racism was an act of racism. Imagine that lifting and exploring acts of anti-Semitism we would be charged with actually acting in anti-Semitic manners. That's what Ron DeSantis was doing. We should understand that at the end of the day, this isn't a conversation around critical race theory, though now it is important for Americans to have the opportunity to understand exactly what critical race theory is and how it functions. We should understand that it is a legal theory and philosophy. Well, let me is, start by, can yeah. I just break in? And may I ask, I wanted to ask Janet to tell us a little bit about, yes. so Janet, your husband, your late husband was really uh, the founder of the, kind of the first person to be formulating this. He was a law professor, as Eric has said. He was very active in, in fighting, you know, working with uh, all the different groups that were fighting for civil rights and writing laws. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about critical legal theory, the critical legal studies that he started, which is the predecessor of CRT. And we'll get to how that morphed first, but give us a little taste of that. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this program. And I'm always fascinated uh, and mesmerized when Eric speaks. So thank you for that. A couple things that I would like to, to, to say is that my husband, did not call himself the founder of critical race theory. He called himself one of those people who helped bring it into the academy. His casebook for law schools, Race, Racism, and American Law, is the uh, law casebook that's taught in law, law schools across the country. Derek always felt that uh, you had to have, as, as Eric indicated, a, a structured study of structural racism. And that's really what he helped develop. And many of the people who speak about critical race theory today are really e either his students or acolytes or, or what have you. The, the book on critical race theory that was published, the first two chapters are by, are by my late husband, Derek Bell, on interest convergence and what have you. But, they, but if you notice, it's not just by black authors, it's Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who is who's a leading voice on this, uh, Kendall Thomas, Gary Peller, and uh, Gary, I always mess up his last name, so I'll, I'll, I will try not, I will not say it right now, but uh, the, 
and so it, what it is is really looking at thank you very much give me give me the fourth person's name because i want to give i want to lift him up and honor him as well i, I mentioned gary peller kimberly crenshaw kendall thomas and neil gotanda neil gotanda please neil forgive me if you're on this call that i that i had a, a quick lapse there but that is a key book for people to know i would say that i am not a lawyer I do not play one on television, but what I have, and I have been dragged kicking and, and screaming into this conversation, which should and was intended to be a conversation among learned uh, jurists and, and law students and what have you, but it has been weaponized by the likes of people we've mentioned. I tried to mention the, 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 the crime without mentioning the names of the criminals because I don't want to give them too much notoriety and I don't want to give them legs. But we have to talk about it, to not talk about uh, what they've done or what, and what they're trying to do and, and to not talk about critical race theory allows people to do, uh, to pervert the idea as they have done and as they have perverted all uh, other other things such as the notion of Christianity why we have black churches and white Christian churches I don't know that and why and why we uh, do not honor the judeo-christian heritage I don't know why we why we do that and we sit back and, and we allow people to to tell us that there is some uh, something that we all should be afraid of what my approach to critical race theory is very simple it's talking about history uh, and it's it's putting it's it's talking about humanity. A friend of mine who is a very distinguished lawyer, not a public figure like some of us, so I won't mention his name, he says as far as he's concerned, critical race theory is the language of love. What does that mean? That means that you talk about those of us who actually believe that you love your neighbor as yourself, that you want to walk in someone else's shoes, and, and that you are, are uh, a lover of, of humanity. That that's what critical race theory is about. Those who want to those who want to weaponize that and use that as a cudgel against American society. Let's be very clear what they are doing. They are using it as an, a racist instrument to not only erase black progress to challenge to challenge that, but to erase the progress of anyone with whom they disagree, whether it's. Uh, uh, you know the Jewish brothers and sisters, well as LGBTQ, whether what whatever it is, and if you ask them what critical race theory is, you get this sort of blank stare because they actually don't know. But the truth is, they actually don't care. Now there's some people like Rufo and others who know what it is and who take great delight in perverting what it is for their for their own means, and we must stand against that and so what i try to do is turn the conversation into the positive first i first i say you know we are at 1159 in many ways because there's some people who would erase the progress of the 20th and the 19th century even before we fully passed the even before we have a full era they want to erase that they want to take us back to this um a mythical place where where uh there's white male let's let's be honest white male supremacy they've gotten some white women to buy into this foolishness as well but it's it's a uh, plutocratic uh, white male uh dominance and mm -hmm. so we have to fight we have to fight against that and i i wanted to i always want to quote one of my favorite people um rabbi abraham joshua heschel who when when was asked about why are you in these civil rights movements and um, and uh, aren't you supposed to be uh, uh, you know a, a, a rabbi who is who is who is thinking great thoughts and who is praying for people and I think his response was and I know I'm paraphrasing this is he said I prayed with my feet and that's what some of us have to do we have to pray with our feet and we have to remember and if you'll see the colors of the ukrainian flag in my apartment and that i'm wearing that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and that and critical race theory to talk about it in the way that we need to first of all it's not being taught k through 12 that is such a false flag among other things we're gonna uh, get we're, yeah, we're gonna so get stop. there You're, we're gonna get to all these topics i just there's so much there's so much, so and much we're there. passionate and by about the way, 
We have a piece coming up in Moment Magazine, which is about Susanna Heschel, um, jo Abraham Joshua Heschel's daughter. And it's a really interesting piece in the next issue. And we discuss a lot of this. It's really very interesting. But I just want to actually to give a, just explain what see, the critical legal theory is, in my view, just so people know. It's a theoretical construct, construct that says that the laws themselves don't necessarily work, like our civil rights laws and regulations, or they don't necessarily do what they were designed to do because of the prejudice or systemic racism, but systemic prejudice that's entrenched and surrounds them. And I think that's a really important point to make. It is an that's important point to make. You know, let me just say this, but sometimes the laws do what they are designed to do. And so if you, and we look at them now and we say, okay, maybe the electoral college, uh, at, at people who are defending that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and who, who try to ignore the racist origins of that, that, the, you know, things are doing what they were designed to do. And what they were designed to do is to keep certain people in power and keep other people out of power. And I, I know, Mia, you'd like to just say a word about this too, because we're going to, I just want to, you have a slightly different I, definition, and I'm just giving a very general definition of what critical legal theory is, because then I want to trans, then I want to transition into what is critical race theory. But, but what is, what do you, how do you view that, Mia? Um, well, I just wanted to, to be a little clearer in the definitions of the two pieces. Um, my background for people is I went to law school and then decided that I wanted a PhD and so didn't finish. And so I, I have um, kind of a, a lot of experience with, with critical race theory and with things being a little bit more hands on and then coming to you have a PhD in legal history, which I think is pretty yeah. damn interesting. Right? Um, well, yeah, so so but so that's my background. But um, critical uh, race theory did come out of critical legal studies, but it came out of critical legal studies because critical legal studies did not include racism and was not taking racism into account in some of the ways that it was analyzing the law. And so I just wanted to, so in, in that critical race theory um, wants to, to address systemic issues, wants to look at impact of laws versus just intent or versus like, or just what the actual language of the law says. There's similarities, but I just wanted to be clear that um, a big reason that we get critical race theory is exactly because critical legal studies is not taking race into account. Absolutely. So there was this evolution, basically. There is legal, there's the, the legal studies, and then there's CRT. And I guess, um, you know, how did that morph? I don't know, just briefly, I'm just curious, how did that morph into it? I guess there was a need for it, but there's was some of this came from actually like activists who, who does, I mean, how did it change? How did it morph? Um, probably all three of us could answer this, but um, yeah. since I jumped into it, um, it's kind of exactly what you think. I mean, it's law professors who are noticing issues and who, as things move along, and it's also seeing problems continuing after the civil rights movement, that critical race theory very much comes out of noticing that the progress made in the civil rights movement, while very important, does not sufficiently fix a lot of issues. And so as you get the, the civil rights movement and we get it mandated that laws have to be facially neutral, which means that they can't be discriminatory in the language of the law. So they can't mention race, for example. They can't say, you know, black people can't vote and white people can. Um, that there's still a lot of problems precisely because the laws are being created by people who either don't take race into account and so don't notice how laws might be um, might have a discriminatory impact or are purposely constructing laws that look neutral but are meant to have a discriminatory impact and so um, so it's very much out of a of a period of a post civil rights, moment and saying, okay, but we're still having a lot of problems. So what do we do with that? Okay. So we have, you know, where, where's, so critical race theory, where is it? A, it's a construct. Um, and we, I think most of us here would argue that it has a lot of, it has many use, it's a, it's a useful construct. And of course it's a theory and all, you know, but it's, a, it's something that where, where is it helpful in looking at society? 
And where is it not helpful at looking at society? And, you know, Eric, you want to say a couple words about this and then we'll let other people talk about it too? Yeah, I'm going to be curious to, to, to hear from, from Leah and, and Janet, but, you know, I would say that here's what we should understand. Um, the main attack against critical race theory, right, is the idea, uh, how can there be a legal philosophy and theory that was developed around race? And Mia just said, uh, quite frankly, that we should understand it's because it wasn't an allowable conversation. Folks had to bring this concept in. And why is it important? It, it's important not because uh, it's, it's about uh, a shaming. It's important because it helps us become a stronger society. The, the stronger our legal and constitutional foundations are in terms of the inclusion of all, right? The stronger democracy uh, uh, that we have. But it also has very real world implications. And I'll share a quick, a quick story about the idea of structural racism or structural bias, right? Jim Crow, right, was a form of structural bias. It was a legal structural system. So were the laws that were put in place, right, in Europe uh, during World War II, pre-World War II, around the discrimination, the persecution, right, of Jews. Those were structural forms of bias, by the way. Many of those laws uh, uh, influenced by American laws of bias, by the way, but another topic for, for another time. So we should understand that there are structural forms of discrimination that if left unaddressed, right, through, through legal means, have real impacts on our life. Case in point, Seattle, Washington was doing incredible work around race equity. They noticed, right, that young people of color, right, weren't showing up for their court dates. And those court dates were then turning into warrants, right? They decided they wanted to do something about that. That's a good thing, right, to bring us forward together. So what they decided was that they would start sending letters to all the youth, not just black youth, not just Latinos, all youth who had court dates to remind them of their court dates. It worked, right? More youth started showing up for their court dates, but here's something strange, right? What they figured out is uh, the disparity, though the racial disparity actually grew, right? So while the overall number of youth who turned up for court grew, right, the percentage of people of color actually shrank and they didn't understand what happened. It wasn't them, right? Their attitudes were in the right place. They were trying to do something good. How could the racial disparity grow? What they understood was there was a structural problem. And by admitting that sometimes structures get in our way, right, and need to be adapted, we find a way and a path forward to equity. Here's what they found out. The letters were coming out from law enforcement, right, and going to people's homes. Uh, uh, if you have grown up in communities of color, right, you're not often inclined to open up things from law enforcement. Um, and uh, so what they figured out was sending people letters wasn't useful. So they partnered with a, with a third entity, a non-police officer association, right? And what they began doing is not sending people emails, but texting people on their phones. And you know what? The disparity almost evaporated. That tells us, right? It's not just about our individual behavior. Sometimes there are structural pieces. And this is what critical race theory has brought into the real world. But it is primarily a legal philosophy and theory. And as I wrote in the chat, theories and philosophy should be debated, right? Derek Bell, right? I, I was lucky enough to spend time sneaking into his classes at the University of Oregon, right? As I was not a lawyer, I didn't understand two thirds of the things that were happening, but there was a debate on theory. That's not what we are in right now as Mia and Janet point out. So I'm about to shut up, right? I wanna keep bringing it back. There is no attempt to debate critical race theory. This is an attempt to attack critical race theory and shut down the debate and to use critical race theory as a basis to attack a host of conversations around diversity and equity and inclusion that happen in classrooms in productive ways each and every day. They wanna pull it out of schools where it's structured and place it on social media where it is divisive and usually leads to a breakdown in community, not in alignment. Okay, 
I'm done. Well, uh, I'm turning it back over. first of all, I've read that, of course, Derek Bell had a lot of conservative students in his classes and was very involved in conversations with, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't an ideologue. I mean, he had conversations with all sorts of people and especially with some of his conservative students. So he was very much into dialogue. This wasn't something, he wasn't an activist who was trying, you know, only had one idea in mind here. Well, no, um, let, let, let me, the person who actually can speak about Derek yes, Bell. Yes, please do. Yes, is that true? Derek, Derek was not uh, an ideologue. He actually would recruit if the, he felt there weren't enough, weren't enough diverse students in his classes, he would ask, that, so aren't there conservative students who can come in so we can have a robust conversation and we can talk in, in, in a safe space. That's what a law school should be, a safe space for people to have conversations. And uh, he, his, Derek developed his, um, first of all, he's a remarkable person. That's a, that's a, that's a whole a different conversation uh, or a longer conversation, but uh, his philosophy of teaching really grew out of a lot of his experience in the civil rights movement and handling a number of cases. You know, he, he, he managed over 300 school desegregation cases. I'm saying that because he was culturally grounded. He worked with the uh, other titans of our time, legal titans, Constance Baker Motley, Thurgood Marshall, uh, uh, Robert Carter. But he always thought about students in our household we always say it's students first derek would not have been at harvard but for uh students who wanted to, ha to have a diverse faculty and if you recall at that time most many of you were not alive then 1969 that there that most of those students were white students so there was an integrated group of students that wanted because they knew that the, that a world that they wanted to create the world that they dreamed was a pluralistic one and for America is a pluralistic society and we had to deal with other people so they 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 recruited and they brought people in Derek felt that his uh, his teaching his being a mentor was was it's always student driven he wanted to honor the fact people say that he led student protests at harvard he said no no i supported student protests at harvard that's a very different kind of attitude same with critical race theory people think critical race theory is about black rights so even if it were black rights about just black rights what would it be but it's not it's about the rights of all of us it's about what what are the laws and the attitudes and uh, that are that are undergirding our culture and what is it that needs to be changed and so when you look at how you interpret critical race theory if you interpret it in the right way it is something that would lift all boats and people who have weaponized it uh, are trying to do are trying to say just the opposite so uh, I think it's very um, it's it's a it what we have to say is that it's just really concentrate on first of all trying to simplify it there's no way that we can have a full conversation about it all the time and people don't want to hear that conversation so what do you say what is critical race theory critical race theory is anti propaganda it's it's what this it's what if we were in uh south africa during the time of apartheid it is anti-apartheid right and so but then later it evolves into what is truth and reconciliation? Even in South Africa, they had a truth and reconciliation commission. In the United States, we don't want to get to the truth. We want to we want to distort people. And they're 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 politicians who disrespect their own people so much that they would lie to them, much like a certain um, dictators in Russia lie to their people and present false flags. Critical race theory has been used and weaponized as a false flag. Well, we're going to get to how to unweaponize it in a few minutes Yay. but let's yeah because that's really important but i want you also kind of brought us into something else and i want to bring mia into the conversation here because so critical race theory how does it connect with the jewish experience it's yeah. a very important question um yes i'm gonna yeah that so i'm going to just take a step back really quick and then i'm going to get to that and i want to say two things one is there was a question in the q a and i know you're going to get to that more at the very beginning of this that i think is relevant here which asked if we know race is socially constructed why do we discuss it in this way as if it's real and I think that that's a really good question to get at some of these larger conversations. And 
for starters, I'm very happy that people here know that race is socially constructed. Um, but while race is socially constructed, racism is not. And I don't mean that it's not socially constructed. Obviously it is, it's from people, but the effects of it are very real. And the effects of discriminatory laws are very real. And so while we should all 100% come from a place where we know that racial distinctions are totally arbitrary, the, the effects of these things are not, and we have to deal with the effects. We have to deal with the harm being done from attempts to classify people this way. Um, and so that really gets into the usefulness of critical race theory as well. Um, I always get frustrated a little bit because in a lot of ways I feel like even using the word theory for critical race theory is a misnomer because what it's dealing with is history, is laws, is cases. When I use a critical race theory analysis, I'm not in a philosophy class. I'm pulling up receipts. I'm pointing to laws that have discriminatory impacts. I'm pointing to a history of, of cases that attempt to de define race that do so very badly. Like, I'm, I'm not having a theoretical conversation most of the time. Of course, we can debate some of the underpinnings, right? I mean, you can agree that racism exists, but have issues with um, the lens of systemic racism. Um, I would disagree with that, of course, but that's a conversation. However, I think people, don't realize that critical race theorists are steeped in evidence. This, this is a very evidence-based conversation. And I think that that's something that really gets lost. Um, and so with that, and with, you know, one book that's, that's you know, um, very important in critical race theory is a book called White by Law by Ian Haney Lopez. And this book isn't actually about Black people. Um, it's about immigrants from various countries attempting to sue the government to get naturalization status. Because for a very long time in American history, you had to be white to naturalize in the United States. Um, and then after the Civil War, it was white or um, with African ancestry. And so you get what Ian Haney Lopez calls these prerequisite cases. And so it's cases of people from all different nationalities bringing a suit and saying, I should be considered white and I should be allowed to naturalize. And what you get is a court system that has no idea what it's doing. This is, you know, the height of scientific racism, the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. This is, we are passing laws all over the country that deal with race, miscegenation laws, um, immigration laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act. You know, this is the height of this conversation. And you, we don't have courts that know how to define race. They and know in fact, you wrote your dissertation on a particular case in the Jewish community. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. Yes, which I'm, which I'm getting to. And, yeah. and so um, what, I, what I'm arguing with here and what I'm getting to is that critical race theory is anti-essentialist, which is another um, argument that's thrown at it. And that in reality, it's breaking down whiteness. It's breaking down white supremacy. It's pointing out that all these definitions are arbitrary. And I can't think of anything more helpful to Jews. Um, and I'll also mention, which is very important, there are a lot of Black Jews. This is not a conversation where it's white Jews on one side and Black people on the other. There are Black Jews and there are plenty of Black Jews in the United States who have to deal with both these conversations. Um, so that's to start. But also most, of, most Jews in this country agree that white supremacy targets us, that we are part of that that problem um, and that, we, that that is an enemy to us, that that is violence to us. Well, can you and give us some examples from the pat that you a little bit of the concrete examples starting with your dissertation? Um, sure. Well, my dissertation talks about um, facially neutral laws, which is again what I mentioned that are laws that don't mention race or in this case Jewishness that can still be discriminatory. And um, but earlier, before the point of my dissertation, there are laws that go into the 1870s in the United States that say Jews can't vote, Jews can't run for office, Jews can't testify in a court of law because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Um, so that's, that's really, we have laws, um, not universally, but there are laws on the books until the 1870s that say things like that. Then where my dissertation comes in and what we're looking at later is laws that do things like require people to appear in courts on Saturdays. And they do not allow someone to say, well, but I'm Jewish, I have to observe the Sabbath that day. No, because as the judges say, the laws apply 
equally to everyone, as in they're requiring Christians to appear in court on Saturdays and Jews to appear in court on Saturdays. And so obviously this is discriminatory. Anyone today would agree that this is discriminatory, but it's not how the law was interpreted then. And it is a very clear example of a law that is facially neutral, but has a discriminatory impact harming Jews. Additionally, you know, even up till today, the, the lack of inclusion with, with understanding of, that Jews should be part of this conversation does feed white supremacy today. It feeds, you know, shootings that we're seeing at synagogues. We were include at the, the Charlottesville um, march where, you know, there were Confederate flags. They were also shouting, Jews will not replace us. So when Jews feel as if critical race theory is coming against Jews because there's discussions of white privilege, they're missing a huge part of this conversation, which is that Jew, white skinned Jews might have some white skin privilege, but we are not fully included in whiteness. And any attempt to deconstruct that, that whiteness or that like, you know, useful, I mean, that um, emphasis on kind of a, a white supremacy or anything like that is always going to come for Jews. And so we need to be standing in solidarity. And we need to be looking particularly at the work of Kimberly Crenshaw on intersectionality. I can't think of anything that gives a better roadmap to solidarity between the Black and Jewish community than intersectionality and critical race theory. By the way, intersectionality is so not a new concept. Although no. if you read the newspapers or, you know, here today, it sounds like it's this terrible, also weaponized, but, you know, it was intersectionality. I just did this book with Justice Ginsburg and we talked about, we wrote about Ernestine Rose. And here's this Jewish woman who was a suffragist who was fighting for women's vote. And at the same time, she was fighting for the abolition of slavery. And that was a huge part of the movement. These, there's been, these, these movements have been linked for, for centuries, I'm sure millennia. Um, yeah, I'd like to interject one thing. And, and because Mia, and Mia, I, we've not met, but I love you. Thank you so much <laughs> for your comments. Uh, but I want, you mentioned Ian Haney Lopez, and he was one of the Derrick Bell lecturers. So I want, you pull, you showed a book. I'm going to do, a, a, I'm going to do a show and tell book too, of uh, the book that I co-edited with Vincent Sadala. And you mentioned it before on race rights and redemption, the Derrick Bell lectures on the law and critical race theory. Uh, I founded this lecture series on my husband's uh, 65th birthday in 1995. And we have had, um, most of the major people who've, uh, law professors who've written about race this coming fall, our Derrick Bell lecturer will be Kimberly Crenshaw. We will have, all, we will, when we have a follow-up email for after this uh, program, we will include links to these books. These are really important books. Yes. Eric, so can I pivot over to you? You so, can always pivot to me. It's so yes. exciting. So you, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the relationship between anti-Semitism and what you call anti-Black racism. And I think you need to pause for a minute to explain to us what anti-Black racism is, because I think it's a, it's an Eric Ward construction. Yeah, I, well, I use it a lot. I wish I could say I constructed it, but, but um, I do like to try to contribute uh, uh, to it. Look, anti-Blackness is, is uh, uh, the term anti-Blackness for me is really just shorthand acknowledgement that the United States, right, was built upon uh, three phenomena that dominated uh, society, right, politically, economically. And those three phenomena were the, uh, uh, of course, the, the uh, genocide and, and uh, uh, stolen resources of Native people, right? the uh, uh, instituting of a system called chattel slavery in the United States, right, which was a particular form of slavery around the world that uh, put people into, uh, uh, that stripped uh, uh, African people, right, of their culture, of their language, right, of, of all their bonds and reformulated them, right, in, into chattel, not just people in slavery, right, but uh, 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 as uh, no different than uh, 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 beast in the fields, right? Cows, horses, et cetera. It's acknowledging that that happened and that that was structural. It's also acknowledging, right, that uh, uh, in the construction, 
right, of race in America, that it was placed on a binary of whiteness and the things that that was afforded on one side, right, and blackness on the opposite end. So as Derek Bell puts, you know, uh, puts it more succinct, succinctly, right, anti-blackness denotes the faces at the bottom of the well and that structurally, right, in this country, no matter how far we advance when it comes to race, that we will always find this binary, right, of, of black and white, and we need to, to be attentive to it, right? We don't need to sit in guilt about it, right? We don't need to sit uh, immobilized, that we need to acknowledge it and then adapt the law, right, to try to bring out more equitable incomes or uh, outcomes. That's anti-Blackness in, in, in the shortest way that I'm happy to have a full conversation. We should understand that anti-Blackness, largely in this country, uh, until the 1970s, functioned right around the idea right, that Black people were to be um, uh, uh, controlled right, in society and their labor exploited. Then comes this 1960 civil rights movement. People have heard me talk about this. It, it sidelines that notion of white supremacy, right? That idea of white superiority. And it opens up the concept and the idea of a competing vision, multiracial democracy that moves all of us forward together. Now, if you were in support of white supremacy and you now have suffered this political loss uh, 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 in the face of this idea of multiracial democracy, how do you understand your loss? You have been trained all of your life and socialized to see Black people as inferior. How could Black people have beaten you politically? Well, for those who embraced white supremacy, they were never going to accept that they lost to the political advocacy of Black people. So they came up with another answer. And, and simply, Nadine, what they did is they borrowed, right, from anti-Semitism, meaning, right, that they placed Jews, right, as the, as the answer to the reason that they lost their white supremacist society. Anti-Semitism begins to play a role. And it's why we often say anti-Semitism isn't just at the core of white nationalism, right? It is the core of white nationalism. And it's become so central, right, to the conversation of race in America that I believe Black people and other marginalized groups will not win our freedoms, right? Will not win equity in the society, will not win opportunity, will not win safety for all if we're not also active in this struggle to uproot this form of, of anti-Jewish hate. Now it gets confusing, right? Anti-Semitism, anti-racism, right? No one wants to say they're an anti-Semite, right? Uh, we understand that that is a negative connotation right? But we do, interesting enough, want to say that we are, we are anti-racist, right? Or hold anti-racist values uh, in our society. The, the meaning of the antis in those two terms are often used, right, to, to try to wedge the Jewish community uh, uh, around this issue. We saw just recently in Florida, uh, um, I thought it was uh, quite clever, right, that the uh, Florida uh, uh, um, opposition to uh, uh, Black history being taught in schools, right, moved legislation to ban discussions on, on discussions of race, but at the same time, simultaneously was advancing, right, uh, legislation to, to um, add Holocaust education, right, into the curriculum. Now, we might sit back and say, like, well, wow, that's a really split piece, Right? Or we might be cynical like I am and to say this was an attempt to try to wedge the Black and Jewish communities against one another, right? to, to make us believe that somehow we do not have a common interest right, in this moment around these attacks on public education, uh, but we do. I remember the early days of this attack on critical race theory, and I remember how nearly every person attacking critical race theory started the story with a narrative, a narrative that critical race theory, right, was started by Jews out of the Frankfurt School, right? For those who don't know, the Frankfurt School, right, was uh, uh, um, Jews and non-Jews out of Europe who fled Nazi Germany and Nazi Europe, came to the United States, right? These were academics, philosophers, and intellectuals. 
and they came together to form the Frankfurt School to understand how you prevent authoritarianism from coming to power, right? It wasn't made up of, yes, there were Marxists in there, but there were folks who were anti-communist who were part of the Frankfurt School, right? It was like Derek Bell was building, a set of diverse voices who were committed around the defense of democracy and opposition to authoritarianism, right? That was their primary goal. That has been used, right, to embed this anti-Semitic narrative, right, into, into the narrative, right, to signal to white nationalists and others that critical race theory, right, is another conspiracy of the, of the Jewish community. This is why we say constantly, right, that anti-Semitism, that narrative, that dangerous narrative embeds itself, right, in most conversations around expanding rights and belonging uh, in American society. And it's why Blacks and Jews need to pay attention. Last thing, and then I'm going to shut up, right? I also believe, uh, um, uh, I write about this in, in an essay uh, that I can't even think of the name. I think it's called Conspiracy Theories or Killings. Um, and I talk about Nadine uh, uh, attending a meeting of Holocaust deniers, right? I got on a bus, so imagine I'm African-American. I get on a Greyhound because I'm certainly not taking my car uh, 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 to this place. I travel three and a half hours by uh, Greyhound to attend a day-long meeting with David Irving, uh, uh, who at the time had sued Deborah Lipstadt, right? And Deborah Lipstadt had bravely uh, stood up Right, and we know British libel laws are are, um, are are hard ones to stand against. And uh, she decided she was going to fight. And David Irving was touring the United States and I wanted to be able to deliver, right, exactly what he was saying in his conversations. And a bunch of us volunteered to, 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 to attend different meetings. Now look, uh, when I got to that meeting, I got to sit amongst Holocaust deniers for the very first time in a very significant way. I got to hear their narrative. I got to hear them talk tactics and discussions, right? And one of the things that I'll say to, to Black folks who are listening, if you want to understand the attacks on critical race theory, do yourself a favor and understand the construction of Holocaust denial in this society and how Holocaust deniers have organized and constructed their arguments to undercut, to raise this idea that the Holocaust never occurred, right? And a, a, a bunch of other points. I also say it's why we need to strengthen our understanding of anti-Semitism. If we had understood Holocaust denial, right, as, as, a, as a form of attack, right, I think we would have recognized this growing attack on critical race theory much earlier. And I think our response would have been much stronger. Hint, teaser. Uh, uh, the tactics being used are not very dissimilar. So that's, thank you. The, so basically I would have to just add here that I think like Holocaust, the debate over Holocaust education, which we've just written about in a moment, which is so important, and also CRT. These are not just wedge issues between, you know, Jews and Blacks. These are wedge issues between Jews and Jews, Jew, and Americans and Americans. The polarization is is so much larger here, and so and we're really having a conversation about authoritarianism. We're having these bigger conversations that we need to focus on, and that that kind of just want to take a moment now just to to look at like memory laws because and just briefly on memory laws because I want to get to like what we can really do, but let's just take a pause on memory laws. Um, memory laws. Do you want to just any who would like to just pop in and talk a second about memory laws? Which, of course, by the way, are, you know, Putin just passed a memory law about how you can remember, you know, the, what happened in his World War II in, in, in Russia, and which, of course, uh, looks, looks badly on Ukraine. And we've seen memory laws passed in Poland. But how, how are memory laws happening here in the United States? Um, yeah, so memory laws are, are directly related to the anti-CRT laws. Um, I mean, I really think that they're, they're one and the same. And, you know, we can see that, and, and, and anti-Holocaust education laws in general, or passing Holocaust education laws requiring Holocaust education, but done in a way that is bad, done in a way that doesn't accurately teach Holocaust education. 
Um, and I think that that's something that is getting lost a little bit as well, that with the examples of mandating Holocaust education, it'll be done in a way that will cast like a small group of Nazis as evil rather than looking at like larger systemic causes. Or it will be done in a way that you can't say that Germans did something bad, you can only say that Nazis did something bad. And on and on and on, I mean, or like that you can't see larger connections, that you can't, and so they'll give lip service and they'll say, oh, well, we're mandating that Holocaust education is taught, but in such a way that it contributes more to Holocaust denialism, to, to not being able to see the connections in terms of American racism and, you know, European anti-Semitism. And so that, you know, in banning mouse here, right? Like in not teaching mouse, in all of it, like we, we heard people on the floor discussing some of these anti-CRT laws. I, I apologize, I forget what state it was, um, where they said that you couldn't, you had to discuss both sides in the Holocaust. That like you couldn't blame. Texas. It was Texas. Okay, yeah. And I mean, so so I think that that's something that's really important to keep in mind is that this is a weaponization of trying to take Jews and say black people are against you. You know, you have to come side with us, but only until we can get you all against black people, and then you know we're going to turn against you too. Because this is lip service. This is not actual Holocaust education, because to do actual Holocaust education, you would have to teach some of the same things that they're banning with the anti-CRT laws. You would have well, to- Well, of course, Holocaust education is based, was started, and we did this big story, which is in this issue here, where we talk about how Hol the Holocaust education was not just ever about what happened to the Jews. It was right. always a bigger, as it was always a bigger project. And, actually, and that's what makes it meaningful and it's very important and very important. We'll put this link of this in there. Yeah, um, I actually, like a new, I don't know about new, but uh, a form of Holocaust denialism that I'm seeing a lot lately is saying that Jews only care about the Holocaust and they only care about Jewish victims of the Holocaust. And of course there's some, I mean, you know, there's individual people and stuff, but it's so hurtful to me as someone who cares about Holocaust education and who was raised very much with it and you see that Holocaust Remembrance Orgs or the Shoah Org or these organizations that are really devoted to this education always include other genocides. Absolutely. Always. Janet, I, I call it one second. I know, Janet, you, I, we're running out of time and I want to be able to share. So, Janet, did you want to say something briefly here? Yes, I want to say something about language, how language matters. And one of the, one of the chapters in the book on race for... Uh, is is uh, taught is by Cheryl Harris, a law professor who's written on the property right in whiteness, and um, that is a very important concept because Jews were not white when they first came to this country. The Irish were not white. We can go. We can go. We can go forth to a lot. A lot of things. So, I also have somewhat. I have another person, another friend who who says that we who does not even like to use the terminology white supremacy because he says that that reinforces the notion that whiteness is normative and that everyone else is uh, who is non-white is not is uh, is not normative and and therefore not at the not at the same level. So and then I think we have to be careful of how we of the way we state these these issues of race because we sometimes as Mia you talked about certain things that reinforce uh, things we're trying to not reinforce talking about white supremacy or, or whiteness in a way that uh, that that's, that reinforces it as um, as as something to be uh, as as to be be desired it's something we have to work on and we have to we have to figure out ways to talk about race talk about whiteness without reinforcing all of this uh, insidiousness well this is a great lead on, lead to let's take a couple minutes here to talk about moving forward um, can we be optim let's let's think about what we're really asking for here is cultural change it's cultural change which is which leads the law, which, you know, it's, which leads everything. And we have seen examples of major cultural change in the United States. And we're really mostly talking about the United States here too. Um, in the past, what can we do here uh, to kind of go towards this deeper cultural change, strengthening democracy um, and stop 
and in, in the long term and in the short term, stop the backlash that the term critical race theory has been, and it only represents, it's not really the term, it's much bigger than the term, what the backlash is. But what can we do uh, to, to, to kind of go beyond that? And I'm going to throw out um, probably something you're all going to hate, but uh, let's, could we just change the terminology? There's so many things about, I know, but I see everybody, I see you shaking your head, no, but let me say, um, so critical, critical is, you know, just a negative word on some level. And race is a word that has just so much baggage. And theory, theory is also a really scary word. You know, I'm a political scientist by training, but, but really, you know, what is theory? It's, it's, I mean, this happens to be very evidence-based theory, but most people don't understand what theory means. So just even the term. Um, so is there a way, when what we're really talking about is prejudice. So it's deeply ingrained prejudice. And that's something that we all have to work. That's like, it's like the project for humanity. We all have to work wherever we are located on the globe. We have very deeply ingrained prejudices, some of them more deeply ingrained than others. We have a project here at MoMA called the Daniel Pearl Investigative Journals Initiative. And we do these deep dives into what's happening in Sri Lanka or what's happening in, with the Rohingya. And there's so much systemic persecution, racism, and prejudice built in worldwide. Look at the Uyghur. I mean, there's just so much. And I don't mean to conflate ethnicity with race. But we're looking at prejudice. So could we come up? Could you guys suggest some other terminologies? Can I? Well, I think I, I just have to say I think prejudice is too soft a term. It does not get to structural racism. Also, and, okay. and I think I think that starting going back to where I where I started, that we have to that this this is a legal it should be a legal conversation. You know, critical legal studies um, and and. So that's where there, where it should be. So one hand, we have to say, okay, there's validity. I don't think we I don't think we give up that we give up that term. We can't give up that term, but we have to put it in context and then at the same time go beyond that. But I do not think that just talking about racism or prejudice helps. I think what that does it 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 really allows the conversation to be driven by this this notion of whiteness it, i think that undergirds that 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 conversation um I a, yeah i yeah. completely agree and I, I think that there's a couple problems with changing it for one thing these are bad faith attacks so what good is changing the language so we change it to something that seems like it fits more into something that won't you know be as problematic they're gonna attack that too i i don't see and i think that giving up our language a, is a way of saying they have a point, and that is just giving up the whole fight. Additionally, the problem with using a word like prejudice is one of the best things about critical race theory is that it is not assigning blame, and it is not individualistic. It is saying, hey, you individual person, you might have the absolute best intentions, you might be, you know, you might be the least racist person in your heart, but you are participating in this system, and this action you took as part of this system has had some some consequences. So let's so look I at that. totally understand that. I totally get this. But we're talking about you we're we're living in a bubble where this we know what this is. I'm looking I don't think I'm I'm talking about communication strategy. Okay. We're all communicators here. Eric is a communicator. I think Janet has like a PhD in communications. This is what she does. You're yeah. a communicator. How yeah. can we communicate? CRT, yeah. I, I got that we don't Here's, even have to redefine, we don't have to communicate yeah. critical legal studies because that's something that people aren't really talking about. I was just yeah. asking about critical legal studies because I think that's important to understand, to understand CRT. But yeah. what can we do? I was just throwing out changing these words. Here's, How can we be a better communicators? Here's what, what I here's what I think, Nadine. I'm here's here's the problem. We, we first have to understand, if, if we first have to accept, right? Critical race theory is a legal philosophy and, and theory, right? Uh, that's what but it it's is. It's not. But, critical but no, no, no. legal theory is. Critical but, race theory is the no, is kind of what grew no, out of it. And no, that's no, what's become no, the buzzword. No, 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 no. Critical no, no, no. race theory <laughs> is 
look, critical race theory is the space upon which critical legal theory is debated and, and discussed. Uh, that, I got that. that but they're not that exactly is, the same. Okay. They're not exactly the same, but, but critical but race can, theory is still quick, legal. Right? It's still, it's still legal. It's still but a it's legal theory. But it's not being interpreted but, as being legal anymore. No, no, no. Anymore. But, but, it's but, it's hang become on. to me folks, so much folks, else. Folks, Nadine, <laughs> hang on. One step at a time. <laughs> One step at a time. First, we have to acknowledge that it is a legal theory and all legal theories are open to debate and critique. They should be, right? That's, that's, we want stronger theory. We want stronger philosophy. Look at commentary. Well, why not you know call it what this? it is? Maybe we need I to look call at it critical Jewish legal text. theory. I look at Jewish text and then I see all the commentary, right? Um, and I realize this is a living, right? It, it's a living debate right? That seeks to kind of strengthen community. That's what critical race theory is. But here's the second piece that we have to move. We have to understand, right? <laughs> Those who have been debating, right? Conservatives and liberals, by the way, right? And in the critical race theory debate are not the ones who politicized it. They didn't bring it out into the real world. That was a political attack, right? I understand Again, that. I got look, that. But look, here's the thing. Is that there's a Rufo, vast number right of here. The lead organizer. Anyone can Google I, his I got name. It. It's Every the, magazine. He tells us that I he understand. took the name but critical race he's, theory. He's thinking in a long-term strategic way. Yes. And you know what? We're not. And what I'm, saying, no, I object you know, and what I'm saying is that there's a vast number of people in this country who yes. do not understand what this term means, and they That's have right. misinterpreted what this term means, Maybe. and Excuse we me. need to address that. Yes, but we address that by doing this. You well, know, there's I many ways to address that. So there's many <laughs> ways to address <laughs> it. So let's just open that up. You only even know I am not someone with a permanent position somewhere. I am a freelance writer who's hustling with a PhD, trying to, to get people to listen to me. You know about me. I was invited to this because I have 20,000 followers on Twitter and I have written about critical race theory in many forums that are completely for the public, not in academia. And so I am not giving up that language and I am convincing people every single day what this means. I okay, don't so I don't want to argue. I don't want to argue about the language. I'm simply asking you guys and myself, how can we bring what the message is? We have what we're go the goal here is to create cultural change, not to argue. We, we know this has been weaponized. Okay. Where do we go from that from here? We have a country of Millions of people, most of whom have a very, not a very deep understanding of CRT or CLT. They, how do we explain what this is and why it's important in a way where more people understand it? That's what my question is. But okay? I'm saying we're doing that. I don't think we're doing it successfully. I think we're, you, I think you're doing a great job, but we have to do it on a much bigger level. We have to increase your voice. We have to increase the voices in a way. I have to increase it. You know what? Rather than just being invited on unpaid panels, maybe someone could pay me to do this. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like you're asking what? for solutions and I'm telling you I am doing this. So you I are one person. You are one person. Let's but, but hear what she, Eric, she, hear what she represents a lot more people. I think what we have to do to answer your question is, we cannot give up this, the, the critical race theory. That is very specific. I think we give a nod to that as, as a legal theory. Uh, I, I will point out the, the, a recent article by a, a con quote, self-described conservative white student who took the only critical race theory at the, at, at the University of Miss, uh, took, uh, took a class in critical race theory at the, at, uh, at the University of Mississippi because she wanted to understand what everybody was crit critiquing and came out and, un and said, wait a minute, this is not what people are saying. She, saw, she then wrote to the, um, the people on the state education committee saying, why are you trying to withhold knowledge from us? So we, we keep critical race theory, but on the other hand, we, we, the positive language that we, that we use is that, what, is that we are aiming toward, uh, a, a, you know, really, toward a beloved community, toward a society that lives up to the principles of democracy. I got it. And I totally want, agree we, with you. But, but, no, but that How do is, we get but there? That, but that is the solution. We do what 
everybody has to has to make take a step to get that done it has to be writing it has to be speaking it's it, it has to be supporting each other but one of the problems that i've discovered as a communications person by the way my doctorate is in leadership and change not in communication okay. i just happen to have uh, a long history in communication mm -hmm. as part of leadership and change but uh so what we ha what we have to do is is get to a point where you know that that we agree on certain we try to agree on certain terminology i've trained scores of organizations eric knows this uh for language uh, uh use of language so that we come up with common language and all of these great liberal groups 30 groups you train them they agree to say the same thing and then they get on the platform get on the stage and they never say anything that you said we say here's the basic theme and then you riff from what your organization does they won't do it because they think they're smarter than everybody what they have to realize is that we're all into together and the whole purpose is as is is communication we don't have an easy answer to this if we, if there were an easy answer we would we, we would have written about it by now right. I think what we're missing and what I'm trying to say is that we do not have a united long term strategy and that we can't all be individual voices and that really with the all that we have turned the somehow this conversation hasn't gone deep enough into the country. It's definitely occurring in the intelligentsia. It's definitely occurring in some bubbles, but it's not occurring when I go home to visit much of my family certain parts of my family i can assure you they they've never heard of this and it just makes them nervous um you know Nadine, and, can i say one yeah. thing though yes i think i think that's right but they've been made to feel nervous they've been they've been targeted they have been targeted by a full-on media campaign right that has sought to demonize no, right i think they just and, don't and in the same in the same way right uh uh we understand the impact of demonization. We we see it. We've seen it with George on George Soros and the Jewish community, right? Uh, uh, it doesn't mean the Jewish community has not done enough to to respond. No, the Jewish community has done incredible work, but it is facing a system of narratives, right, that seek to place the Jewish community in a specific position in the same way, right? It's. It's a narrative piece. So what do we do about it? I, I have some ideas, right? Yes, let's hear. The, the first thing that we do about it is, is one, right? Uh, start debating critical race theory. If, if the right, right, who are hostile, right, to inclusion, and that's not all conservatives, that's not all folks on the right, right? But if there are folks who are, who are hostile to the idea of inclusion and they have made critical race theory right? They're uh, a dog whistle, right? We should fully debate the dog whistle. We don't have to run from this, but we May should I, understand. Eric, we do. We, we, wait a minute. I, I, I have to respond to that. I yes. was on a panel recently at Boston University, which was an interdepartmental, interdisciplinary panel, and the, the dean of the School of Law, Angelon Witchy Willick, another former Derrick Bell lecturer, brilliant woman, gave uh, an analysis of critical race theory. But the point of the panel was they said, defining, not debating critical race theory. And in that defining it, uh, you, you, you obviously have to, you're debating it somewhat, but it was, defi it was defining what it is. And it was really one of the, and I, I will suggest that people really look that up there's a great uh, uh video online they 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 taped the program but it was a great conversation where where people took the they were able to take a longer look at 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 the at the at the, at the topic and they use and they did it from as we're doing today from different lens but i think one of the things that we have to do is that and and i don't know why people are reluctant to do this cuz i've suggested to other people that we need to gather a whole bunch of folks for more than an hour or two hours and we need to really really need to ask the kinds of questions that you're asking nadine but in a way that we have a chance to really consider them and have i know, wish we could have started them earlier but we had a lot of places to get but let me just say and also we're running out of time i, I just want to say that we have had debates about critical race theory and 
Mia participated one at, with, at Moment Magazine. And I, I've, I've seen others in the Jewish community and outside the Jewish community. And largely, there aren't really very good arguments against the things that critical race theory stands for at all. There are no they're good arguments. Very weak, they're very weak <laughs> arguments. So it's they're not a matter of debating what it, I, I mean, I think we have to think about how we, what we're, what our future is. And it's, maybe we need to do part two of this because you guys all have such amazing ideas. So could we just, I'd like, we're going to have to end and I, but I'd like to ask each of you, if you just have like one thought you'd like to share with us before we leave. And so Mia. Um, I think the biggest thing I would like to say particularly because this is to a mostly Jewish audience is that our best way to fight anti-Semitism is through solidarity. And that's not to say that we don't ever face anti-Semitism in spaces that call themselves anti-racist. It's not to say that there isn't anti-Semitism on the left, though there's, you know, anti-Semitism knows no political ideology. There's plenty on the left and the right. You know, it's not to say that we won't be uncomfortable or that, you know, we're always walking into a good faith space, but it is to say that ultimately our only chance at liberation, our only chance at fighting anti-Semitism is by doing the work with other groups and particularly the Black community and finding solidarity through that work. And Mia, I want to thank you very much for being on this panel and for doing all the work you're doing. And I, I hear it sounds like it's very, it's not an easy path that you're on. And thank you so much for doing it and participating in our other debate as well. And we're going to be sending that to people in the follow-up as well for Mia's very eloquent defense of CRT when we did a debate. Um, Janet, would you like to share something before we leave? Yes, first of all, I think that the, uh, the anti-Semitism in the black community has been distorted by the, by the media and others. I want, I want to, I really want to say that uh, because the, the way that criminalization in the black community is, is distorted, I think that that's, I don't, I want to really end that narrative. Uh, I want to acknowledge that there's some anti-Semites in the black community, of course, but I think it's really been blown out of out of proportion for a number of reasons. And um, and I, I admit that I probably live in a bubble somewhat. You know, I'm, I, I'm on the advisory board of the Andrew Goodman Foundation. I know I don't have to explain that to this audience. Um, and I just, I feel that we, that that if you look at the work of that organization and other organizations that are, are multi, I, I live a very, I live the life I talk about. I live a multi-racial, multi-faith uh, life. My, I, I have a simple philosophy and that's, I'm, I'm my mother's baby girl, Willie Mae Neal's baby girl, and her simple philosophy in life was, you treat people like people and you love everybody regardless. Thank you. That's beautiful. And I want to thank you for participating in this too. And, and your point is really well taken because the name of this series is called the Wide River Project. And the reason it's called that is because there's so many people who have a, think that, you know, the Black Jewish community has, you know, broke up here or we, this happened there. And there, there's so many different uh, channels in which the black Jewish relationship has occurred over the last centuries. And we're exploring some of those. And many of them are really positive ones. And we end up getting hung up on, you know, what happened in 1968 or Farrakhan. And while they are part of the conversation. Um, so anyways, um, thank you so much for bringing that up. So um, Eric, would you like to- Of course I do. Finish us up? Take us First out, all, and then we're going to go back to Suzanne. We're going to go back to Suzanne. So Nadine, so great to hang with you. I love our conversations. I love how sparky. I hope folks are kind of feeling this. We're going to have a lot more conversations over the years. Look, I only have one, uh, one thing to say in three parts. So I want to thank um, Mia and Janet for uh, adding, I think, just great richness to this conversation. I want to thank everyone for their comments, right? I've been trying to answer as many as I can. Apologies if they feel short, right? Uh, don't, don't read any tone in there. That was just me trying to get out as many answers as I could. I am putting an article uh, that I just wrote uh, for American Federation of Teachers 
uh, uh, in the chat right now. Uh, I have a challenge for folks on this third piece. Let's continue this conversation. I would be so honored if you read this article and then found me over on Twitter at Bulldog Shadow, find Mia, find Janet. Let's continue this conversation online, right? And, and, and let's try to be thoughtful. Let's be complicated. We're not trying to convince one another of a position. We're merely trying to bring nuance and, and understanding to a conversation. We can do that. Let's show the world we can do that. Yes, and we can do that. And also, there are so many questions in the chat, which are such great questions. So we are going to be, again, sending you a follow-up email with a lot of these articles and every, links to everything and everyone in it. But I think we're also going to maybe put some of these, publish some of these questions online, which we couldn't get to because they're so great. So we will be sending you information about that as well. Suzanne, can I invite you back in? Sure, as I know actually, we've gone over time. <laughs> that's okay. I was going to say the exact same thing about we're sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. And um, I want to let people know, I know some people had some trouble accessing the links from the chat. We will be sending a, a follow-up email in a few days that will include all the links there. And I know people have also asked for the titles of more books. So maybe um, if our panelists would like to send me a list of books that you suggest, we can start to compile a library of books that are good resources. And we'll put that on our website and we'll send it in the email. Um, and again, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Eric and Nadine. We really appreciate it. As Eric mentioned, at the beginning. This is just the beginning, the start of conversations. It's not the ending. We have a whole year to deep to dive deep into these conversations, and we hope that everybody will join us um, for the next one, uh, which will be announced shortly. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Amazing. Janet, Eric, and Nia, especially. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. What an amazing group.